And so I know you, you're familiar with some of Alex Epstein's work and how it's being received. And there's places in which you, in fact, are in agreement. And then there's also a very core place in which there's, there's, a, there's a difference. And it would seem to relate to this point about um, that there are, in fact, not abundant fossil fuels. And on top of that, we do not own them as an endowment in that regard to incorporate that deeper sense of um, respect for the, the total life process that hum human beings are involved in and matter as life as well, but that there is a way to appreciate a whole systems relation there. And so I am curious about how you relate to, to that sort of narrative and, and how you would address it. I don't know Alex Epstein. Uh, at all. Um, forget about him for the moment. Um, if you just close your eyes and imagine the world today with the Russia uh, NATO war and people are worried about climate change, they're worried about the economies and someone who's attractive and charismatic comes out and says um, fossil fuels are really important. They give us huge benefits. There's plenty left. We need to go after more of them. And climate change is kind of a hoax and a, um, a red herring, and it's, it's actually a good thing. And if that has marketing and promotion behind it, lots of people will like that story because it makes them feel better about their own lives. It obviates any need for personal sacrifice or change. And it's just kind of a soothing populist story um, in contrast to something that is more threatening, more scary, will require some interventions by governments, by our fellow countrymen and women, and by ourselves in the near future. You can just tell right there which sort of stories will populate and which will be considered fringe. <clears throat> and that's not a new thing, but I think the more that events in the world get dicier and more intense, the more that we will be looking metaphorically for, for bread, and, bread and circus types of stories, not all of us, probably not me and you, uh, but large numbers of humans uh, will. Now to Alex Epstein, um, he had a, a recent uh, essay that I read, um, 20 Myths About Energy. Uh, I read them and the first 10, I was like, oh my God, this like came directly from my material. I mean, he writes about some of the things I said earlier on this podcast, um, using different facts and, and lenses, but the magnitude of economic benefits ha that have accrued to humans because of coal, oil, and natural gas are gargantuan and not widely understood. He's totally right about that. He's also totally right about the fact that renewable energy, solar, wind, geothermal, uh, nuclear to some extent, um, are not able to get rid of fossil fuels and power our society on these renewables in like a plug and play, and that there are challenges and costs, and that if we do it blindly and just say, grow as much renewable energy as possible, try to get rid of this polluting energy, we're going to have systemic breakdowns and um, big problems in our energy system. I think he's got a few nuanced things there wrong, but by and large, he's right about those two points. But then is where I disagree strongly uh, with his, his views. Number one is he says peak oil has never happened and won't happen, uh, which, you know, it, it's a certainty that at some point peak oil will happen because just like if you're picking apples on the tree and you pick all of them you can reach, there's a bunch left, you can get a ladder. Eventually there won't be any apples left. The same with this endowment of, of uh, fossil carbon. And I, I can tell you some examples about that in a second, but 
we have done everything possible to squeeze as much out as we could using new technology, using uh, debt, uh, both as an economy and as the oil uh, investing sector. And all this has done is really just kind of widened the size of the straw, which we're slurping out the oil and made it much closer to that slurping sound you get at the end of a, of a milkshake. So the United States has more oil wells drilled than the rest of the world combined. And we have different oil provinces. We have Alaska, we have the Gulf of Mexico, we have the lower 48 conventional. And the United States peaked in 1970 in oil production. We had a 40 year decline and then it started to go up again partially because of us, uh, Alaska, partially because of the Gulf of Mexico, but mostly because we started to drill the, the shale oil, the light tight oil in the Baca and the Permian, uh, et cetera. This stuff is the source rock. Uh, this is where all the other oil migrated from and there's nothing left after the source rock. And when you drill it, you get 90% of the full production of that new well in the first 18 months or 80 to 90%. So right now in the United States, which is one of the top three oil producing countries in the world, technical language thing, oil extracting countries in the world, because um, we're not producing the oil, right? It's already been produced, we're pulling it out of the ground. Um, if we were to stop drilling today, for whatever reason, for an environmental worry reason, for an activist reason, for a we can't afford it reason, any reason at all, the total production of the United States would decline 40% in the first year and another 25% the year after that and another 20% after that. So right now in the United States, the largest consumer of oil in history, we have to continue to drill new wells in less pristine, uh, I mean, less quality reservoirs just to, to keep constant. So U.S. oil production will peak and decline this decade, and with it will be global oil production. Now, here's another thing, is on the upslope, we just count all the oil in the world, and if a country doesn't need it all, they'll export it somewhere else, and it's a global economic system, and the rising tide is lifting all boats, and there's international cooperation and letters of credit and all this. But once growth ends or is problematic or there's a global uh, uh, move towards a multipolar world and the US dollar might not be the reserve currency or certainly we won't price baskets of commodities or oil in US dollars like we always have. When these things start to happen, you have to look under the, the hood a little bit as I said before, the United States, Russia, and Saudi Arabia are the three largest oil producers in the world, but the U.S. uses more oil than we produce, so we have to import oil. Saudi Arabia and Russia use far less oil for their own industries and populations than they produce, so they export a lot. So 46% of all oil that's available for purchase in the world and the markets is produced in Saudi Arabia and Russia. So there becomes this geopolitical limit to oil availability. So um, the scarcity and the fact that we may soon be heading into lower fossil fuels uh, per year, as opposed to more, even if we want more, even if everyone agrees with people like Alex Epstein that we want more, I don't think we're necessarily going to be able to get more because of depletion. Depletion is all the existing wells in the world right now are depleting at six to six and a half percent a year, which means if nothing changes, they drop at six percent a year. And we're offsetting that by drilling new wells and finding new things. So I disagree with him that we will be able to grow our fossil fuel future much more. But the biggest area that I disagree with him, he's like two or three degrees of climate change, that would be good for the world. Climate change is not an issue. And this is just so patently wrong on, on, on many, many fronts. I think he's right in that parts of the environmental movement have had this shrill, the world is gonna collapse in 10 years if we don't do something about climate. 
and there's going to be runaway. We're turning into uh, Venus um, and it's unavoidable and humans are going to be extinct in 20 years. There are a lot of stories out there that are pretty incredulous, um, but it's apparent and people in Australia are quite aware that climate change is probably not a hoax, uh, given some of the events that you've experienced uh, in the recent few years. But the issue with climate change and many environmental issues is the, the, the negative impacts are going to be backloaded. And by the time we actually see, oh my God, this is so serious, it will be far too late to do anything about. But right now the ocean is acting as a buffer for human economies. 90% of the excess heat that has been produced from the greenhouse effect and from the burning of fossil fuels has gone into the oceans. And eventually they will not be able to act as this, uh, this buffer uh, and then temperatures really start to rise. Now, personally, I think the end of growth and the resulting economic and geopolitical response to that is going to be a much bigger issue in the next 10 years than climate change. But climate change in the next century um, and the other, uh, you know, CO2 is only one of the pollutants that comes from uh, hydrocarbons. There's also the uh, um, PFAS or the forever chemicals, like a, a, a milk jug. I assume you have those in Australia. That, that milk jug will last for 700 years before it degrades. And when it degrades, it'll degrade into smaller uh, forever chemicals that will be around forever. So we already, uh, um, science has uh, shown a new paper out last month that sperm count of human males and animals is dropping 1% a year. And this is globally. Um, and this is thought to be from the outgassing of the petrochemicals that come from our plastics that just rub off a little bit and they're so small that they become airborne and they precipitate in the water. Um, you know, there are people like Alex Epstein who are narrowly focused and they're, they're correct in some of the things that they're saying. But on the arc of the long, of the larger uh, uh, observation of our systemic situation, they're not even wrong. They're not even in the conversation. Uh, you know, another thing that gets pushback on, and it's just hard for me to fathom this, um, is people dispute the fact that we're having massive animal population declines. And again, partially this is due to some shrill cries by environmentalists who are exaggerating the claims and saying that we've lost 70% of species on earth in the last 50 years or claims like that, that have a little bit of the correct facts, but mostly wrong. There was a study that came out that said the average animal, bird, fish, reptile population on earth declined by 70% since 1970. That was what the study said. Now there's approximately 10 million species on the planet. We don't really know how many. Um, but what scientists did is we don't have the money and the time and the scientific research help to go and catalog and count all the species. So they did censuses on 31,000 species, you know, rhinoceroses and certain sorts of insects. And on average, the average drop during that time was 70%. So some drop 95% and some drop 10%. So this is like a freaking stunning reality that since I've lived on the planet, we've lost 70%, not of the species, but of the numbers of individual organisms in those species. That is a big freaking deal. And this was happening before we found fossil fuels, really. This started, uh, you know, a long time ago. But, but, but let me throw one, one more thing out, uh, Tim, and then I'll, I'll, I'll pause and, and let you uh, respond. Our system requires growth because we create money, both at commercial banks and at governments, but mostly at commercial banks. When we create the money, we don't create the interest that the 
borrower of the money will eventually have to pay. So this writ large globally acts as this exponential growth imperative that the whole system has to grow. The whole system is 99% tethered to energy. So if we uh, grow our economy, if we grow our GDP by 100%, we're going to grow our energy needs by 99%. So all the world governments and institutions in the world more or less expect that we will grow at 3% a year as a global economy into the future. If that happens, we will double the amount of energy that we need in the next 20 in the next 30 years. And we will double the amount of materials that we need like copper and trees and you know uranium or or any any sort of metals um because materials and GDP are 100% correlated. If we double the size of our economy, we double the size of the materials. So the default scenario is that in the next 30 years, we will use more energy and materials than have been used in the last 10,000. Because every doubling is the same quantity as all prior doublings. And then there will be another doubling from 2050 to 2080. And so when you look at our fossil future and, you know, the, the story that these um, narrow, uh, charismatic, smart spokespeople are out there talking about, it just doesn't look at the magnitude of how the system fits together. And what I just said is kind of scary and ominous and threatening. How are we going to, first of all, what if we are able to quadruple our energy and materials in the next uh, 60 years? What, what's left of the natural world and our ecosystems that are our life support systems in that scenario? On the, on the flip side, what if we're not able to have the next doubling? Then uh, how, do, how do we distribute resources? Um, and what is the political system that manages that? These are very serious questions. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that's why we're doing this podcast. These are the sorts of things that we have to start to navigate.